Okay, everybody, we're going to move on now to part two of our anorectal disorders. I hope that you've already watched part one, um, but as I had mentioned there, these are very, very high yield things. A lot of medical students just simply don't get clinical exposure uh, to some of these disorders on their rotations. Um, so it's going to be very important that you study them because these are all very, very high yield for your exam. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very much who have already donated. And definitely feel free to subscribe and you'll have uh, notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so we're moving on now. We'll talk about some more infections. Um, we're going to start with Hydradenitis suppurativa, which is... Um, not only, um, it, it's not restricted to uh, the anorectal area. You can get this in all sorts of areas. Um, and we'll talk about a few other surgical disorders and we'll finish um, with uh, a malignancy, which is not common, but uh, important to uh, keep in your differential because obviously if you miss malignancy, you're going to be in a whole world of hurt. Hydradenitis suppurativa is an infection of the apocrine sweat glands. Um, this can happen in a variety of areas. It's usually going to be in intertrigonous areas, so skin folds. Think of areas like the armpits, uh, the leg pits. Um, think of um, around the breasts, and then, of course, in the anal genital area. There is an association with obesity, and the reason for that is because you just have more areas of your body that are compressed up against each other, um, you know, the love handles and stuff like that. Um, so in a lot of instances for these patients, um, you know, this is going to be protracted. It's very difficult for this to go away. It comes back. Um, so weight loss is going to be an important part of management we'll get to in a little bit. This usually appears as a tender pea-sized or marble-sized comedome. Um, and a lot of times you get you have a lot of them and they can kind of bridge together. Um, if they break, they'll be pus. These are abscesses. Um, and they persist for a long period of time. There's really, they don't go away. The, so once you develop this, uh, it needs to be managed uh, medically or surgically, usually surgically. Um, it is symptomatic. Um, if you have this, it's going to be painful, burning, um, and the diagnosis here is clinical. So this is yet another skin disease where you need to be able to look at it and see it and, and know what it is. Um, there's really no labs and certainly we don't biopsy this. Um, so you need to know what it looks like. And on that note, please watch my video where I go over pictures. I can't include it here because these are really nasty looking. YouTube will flag it and they'll tell me uh, they'll, they'll make people sign in and stuff, and I, um, so I just include that in another video. Treatment here is surgical excision of the affected area, um, and it's pretty much as simple as that. It does recur often, um, so weight loss and lifestyle changes are an important component of our management. Okay, we're going to talk about the anorectal abscesses here. Very important. So the anal rectal abscess is caused by obstruction and infection of the anal glands and crypts. Uh, the abscess can spread elsewhere, um, usually contiguously. The abscess is going to be defined by its location of extension. Perianal abscess is most common, and that's the one that's going to come up in your exam. The symptoms here are what you can imagine with an abscess. So it's constant, severe pain with surrounding erythema. It's red, it's swollen, it's hot. Um, and uh, occasionally these patients um, can develop signs of, of, of fever and generalized um, inflammation. But uh, this is going to be very apparent when you look at pictures of it, when you examine these patients. On physical exam, it, it's really the location that varies, but the perianal abscess is going to be obviously around the anus, um, so you'll be able to note it there. The big differential here is hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids have a dusky, purplish, bluish appearance. Um, those patients will never have fever. Um, and, and typically those abscesses are, uh, sorry, um, those masses, uh, external hemorrhoids 
uh, are, are right next to the anal orifice, whereas these can be a little bit further away. Another important differential is a pilonidal abscess. That tends to be higher up um, around the uh, sacrum or coccygeal region. Um, so um, that is gonna be important for you to know. And in my pictures, you'll be able to see the, the distinction is, is fairly clear. The treatment for an anorectal abscess is incision and drainage, um, and then you'll likely be giving them antibiotics because typically you have some cellulitis alongside this. Um, this can usually, with the perianal abscesses, be done in the clinic. Um, you're going to have a surgeon do it, you're not just your regular general practitioner, uh, but this can be drained under local anesthesia. Um, these are the different locations. As you can see, the perianal abscess is typically very close to the anal orifice. These other ones, um, the ischiorectal abscess uh, is usually a little bit more uh, further out um, on the buttocks. The others are more internal. That's going to require um, more uh, delicate surgical management. Fistula and anal uh, is also called an anal fistula. Um, but fistula and ano is the Latin term that commonly gets thrown around, uh, but you should know both terms. Okay. This is an important complication of both Crohn disease and the anorectal abscess. Anytime you have inflammation, you can develop a fistula. Half of patients who had one of those anorectal abscesses that we talked about will go on to develop a fistula. And this is something that is much more complicated as far as management. We cannot manage this in the clinic. This is going to require surgery. The symptoms here are constant and foul smelling per perianal discharge. You can't, you know, when you, uh, if, if you've got smelly stuff around the butt, you usually think it's poop, right? Uh, and this is completely different. This is inflammatory stuff. Um, so you can have, if, if this does make its way to the rectum or, you know, to that area, um, I suppose you can have feculent drainage, but typically this is going to be uh, either pus or in some cases feces. But the thing here is that you can't control what comes out of a fistula. It's going to be constantly seeping out. So these patients will have drainage of smelly material throughout the day. So constant and foul smelling perianal discharge with emphasis on constant. Uh, they may have some pain and swelling, they may have some bleeding, but what you're going, the way you're going to diagnose this is on physical exam. The treatment here is surgery, it's fistulotomy, and usually there's going to be a seton placement. You just need to know it's surgical management. Genital warts are certainly not limited to the perianal area. Um, you get this in the external genitalia. You get this in the cervix. Um, this, is, um, this is an STD, uh, but it can happen anywhere in the, uh, it can happen anywhere in the genital or, or anal rectal area. Of course, you can also get these uh, warts elsewhere too. Uh, but we're focusing here on anorectal. Now, warts uh, or condyloma acuminata, if we're talking about HPV-derived warts, uh, are derived from those lower, uh, those uh, serovars of HPV that are, are lower risk for cancer. So those are going to be 6 and 11 as opposed to 16, 18, 21 and higher. Uh, the symptoms here are typically itching and burning, although generally the way that these patients are going to present is that they notice it. Now, the problem is most people are not looking at their anus. Um, if you've got genital warts, you know, on the penis, on the vagina, um, those are going to be something people notice right away. Um, so sometimes these patients, if they, especially on an exam question, if they present, what they're going to tell you is they have a sensation of a mass around the anus. The anus is full of nerves. You can feel pretty much anything. Um, it's why external hemorrhoids are so painful. Um, so they may be able to appreciate um, a perianal mass. And fortunately, this is super, super easy uh, to diagnose clinically. They are kind of cauliflower shaped lesions. Um, they tend to be the same color of this as the skin, maybe a little bit darker, uh, but fairly easy to diagnose. 
Um, the definitive diagnosis is biopsy, but typically we don't need to do that. Now, a very important differential for any kind of wart is molluscum contagiosum. Um, this can be sexually transmitted, but not always. Um, this, the way you're going to differentiate it is just, again, on clinical appearance. Uh, molluscum contagiosum, rather than being cauliflower in appearance like that, tends to be flatter, and there's a characteristic central umbilication, uh, and that's going to be the dead giveaway. The treatment for genital warts varies. Uh, usually, we approach this medically at first. Uh, Syncatchins or amiquimod can be used. Um, surgery is an option for patients, especially with larger warts. Um, that could be cryotherapy or uh, local excision. Now, in immunocompromised patients, they may go on to develop these and develop a lot of them because um, your immune system is obviously keeping this in check. Um, so some of these patients, uh, if they're immunocompromised, may need longer therapy. We'll finish with squamous cell carcinoma of the anus, not common at all. This is a malignancy that originates from the squamous cells of the anus. Shocker, right? This is also linked to HPV, but uh, similar to cervical cancer versus genital warts, this is associated with those higher risk variants like 16 and 18. Um, there is an increased risk in, in immunocompromised patients, as we just talked about with genital warts. Same exact concept there. Symptoms are variable, but if they do present, it's going to be rectal bleeding. But a lot of these patients do not present until they're progressed. And the reason is because, one, it's hard to see, and two, they just don't cause symptoms um, until they get further on down the road. And that's a big, big, big problem because we don't want cancer. We want cancer to present as quickly as it happens. Um, but those, a lot of those cancers, they themselves are not super problematic. It's the, the problem is they just don't manifest until later on when they've often spread to lymph nodes or even metastasized uh, to other parts of the body. Um, so look for rectal bleeding. They may have perianal pain. A big, big problem is the confusion with hemorrhoids. So make sure that you are, are bearing that in mind. Look for the patient's history, especially if they uh, have a history of maybe diagnosed HPV. Maybe um, they engage in frequent anal intercourse. Um, that raises your risk, uh, but you've got to make sure that you can tell um, this from hemorrhoids. This doesn't get tested very frequently. So this is fairly low yield. Just know that this should be on your differential. Um, this is typically appreciated either grossly or on digital rectal examination. But because we are concerned about cancer, um, we want to make sure that we are confirming the diagnosis visually and then also doing a biopsy that is the most accurate test. The treatment is typically 5 fluor a year or so chemotherapeutically based. Uh, it's radiation. You don't need to know that. Um, but one word I would know is the nigral chemoradiation.